Raise your hand if you love horses. Well, it's a good thing because there's only two kinds of people in the whole wide world. Horse lovers and the other kind. Now, what a greater place to be than to be right here in the horse capital of the world, Ocala, Florida. Marion County has over 80,000 horses of every kind, type, and size. Everything from Tony the Pony to Danny the Draft Horse. Now, not everybody loves horses, and I can tell when they say things like, horses are dangerous. Horses are expensive. That's usually the husband. Horses stink. Now, us horse lovers, when we get close to our horse, get up close and personal, but before we do, we take a look right and left, make sure no one's looking, especially if from the other kind, and we get in and we get a big <laughs> whiff of horse. There ain't nothing like it, because horses are nature in its finest form, so much so that the Latin word for horse is equus, which means equal us. Now, this is in a paradoxical hypothetical relationship because the horse is the ultimate prey animal. We are the ultimate predator. Why would they let us catch them? Why would they let us halter them? Why would they let us touch them and ride them and race them and jump them and do all the wonderful things that they do? I know that for sure that horses complete us and there's only one way that we can complete them and then that is if we have and learn the natural principles of true partnership to create equus. So I'm here today to share with you how horses have enabled me to be able to learn these principles and to employ them. Now, I've had horses in my life since I was three years old. And today, I'm a professional horseologist. I'm also a success coach for thousands of horse owners around the globe, including some very high-profile horse lovers like the Queen of England, Ronald Reagan, Tony Robbins, and the Dog Whisperer. Yes, Caesar Milan, even he loves horses. Well, it's easy to see what, why we could love horses, because they are so special to look at. There's something about them. But greater than all of that, I'm the proud father of a handicapped child. My son, Caton Ryder Pirelli, is 37 years old. He has hydrocephalus and a form of autism. Now, before I share his success story with you, using love, language, and leadership in equal doses and embellishing it with lateral thinking, what I want to do is answer your question. What in the world is a horseologist? Well, some people call us horse whisperers. Some people call us horse tamers. Some people call us equine ethologists. But we are certainly not people who break and train horses using mechanics, fear, and intimidation. We are real horsemen. So one of my most legendary, and, but what we do is we use communication, understanding, and psychology to rehabilitate horses who have behavior problems who have been created by their humans who don't understand them in the first place. One of my most legendary re rehabilitation projects and partners is a little black mare named Magic. Now, when I met her, her name was not Magic. Her name was Spider because she was known as the Black Widow. She, I met her in Australia, in a little, little island down below called Tasmania, and 300 people came to this clinic to see if these principles of true partnership could be employed with even a horse like her. She had been through six professional trainers. They all said she was untrainable, and she was so dangerous she should probably be euthanized. By the second day, this, I started a relationship that started to bud into a de and develop into a partnership, and I loved her so much, I bought her, purchased her, flew her all the way back to America, and did thousands of demonstrations around the world with her to share with the world how this could be. She was my dream horse. She was everybody else's nightmare. As we can start to go and start to realize, how does this happen? Now, my, my horse life has had some up and downs. When I was very young with horses, I was passionate about horses. Horses, 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 no matter where I would go, looking out the window, horses, horses, horses. I was passionate. I wasn't much of a reader, but I read the whole series of Walter Farley books, The Black Stallion. And he had a whole bunch of, but the one that impacted me the most was one called The Horse Tamer. Now, The Horse Tamer was Alex Ramsey's, Ramsey's uncle. Alec was the main character in the whole Black Stallion series. And it turned out his uncle was so good with horses that he could tame any horse, anywhere, anytime, under any circumstances. And that inspired me to want to be really good with horses. I wanted to be so good with horses that even horses thought I was brilliant. 
My 4-H leader said, you should get a job, a career with horses. So guess what I did? I took her advice. I found a stable not far away, one that I could ride my bicycle to, that had a professional horse trainer. He was a world champion, and everybody there said his word was gospel, even though he was a bit rough with horses. So I went there. I got a job. I started right at the bottom. I started sleep cleaning stalls. Then I started grooming horses. Then I started exercising horses. And I was such a good rider, even as a teenager, they put me on young horses that had never, ever been ridden, and even on some older horses that didn't want to be ridden again. I got so good at staying on horses that I ended up having a 14-year rodeo career. I, yes, I rode bucking horses until my brains came in. <laughs> now, this man was rough and tough with horses. And the horses that made it went on and did real well in the show pen, and his program was easy for human and hard on horses. But it was easy for me to follow. All I had to do was follow what he did. Just be chauvinistic, be autocratic, be anthropomorphic. You know, put human thoughts and values into animals' actions. Show them who's boss. And all we had to do is be linear. He had a cookie-cutter program that was so easy for humans, but so hard on horses. And so it was easy for me because I had this condition then called young man's disease. <laughs> well, I followed that. I guess, philosophy for several years after that. And one day on my way to the stables, I'm driving there and I had this sinking feeling that my dream of being really good with horses, so good that even horses thought I was brilliant, had turned into a nightmare for me and the horses. Because that morning I felt like I was broke and the horses had all the bucks. And lucky for me and thousands of horses since then and thousands of horse lovers, I ran into a real horseman that taught me the natural principles of true horsemanship. He said, it's easy. Use love. His name was Troy Henry. He said, use love, language, and leadership in equal doses and embellish it with lateral thinking. You have to think outside the box to solve these puzzles. Sometimes us horse lovers say, think outside the barn. And what he did, he shared with me how simple it was if we kept it natural. But he said to me, you want to become a horseman not a horse trainer, because they just use mechanics, fear, and intimidation. We're going to use communication, understanding, and psychology. We're going to put principle and head of purpose. He took me under his wing for five years until he graduated to Horseman's Heaven. After he passed away, I knew I needed to share these principles with the world. In 1982, I put my first seminar on, and I walked out in front of 30 people and said these words. Horsemanship can be obtained naturally through communication, understanding, and psychology versus mechanics, fear, and intimidation. And if you want to be really good with horses, all you have to do is watch, watch everybody else and do the opposite. <laughs> that was over two million seminar goers ago. Now, I have shared these principles with all these different people, all these different horse lovers around the world. But these principles needed to be challenged. In 1983, my son was born. Kate and Ryder Pirelli had hydrocephalus, and at three months of age, he went into a coma. We took him to Oakland's Children's Hospital. We lived in Northern California at the time. And the doctors, the surgeons there did MRIs and said, we think we can put a shunt in to relieve the pressure. But the MRIs show so much brain damage. He'll pro if he lives through the night, he'll probably never walk or talk and he'll have to be institutionalized. Well, the shunt did work, but my giver-upper didn't. We took him home and by the time he was six, he could walk okay. But you know what he could do? he could always raise his hands up because every time I would ride by a horse, he would have those hands up there and say, Daddy, Daddy, I want to get on a horse. And I would put him on a horse, usually bareback. I'd put him on in front of me. And then, you know what happens? Something magic. We've all heard about hippotherapy and how it helps handicapped individuals. I could feel something happening down in his legs that wasn't happening before. Some little something that was going on there. And I thought, there it comes. It's starting to happen. So then I started to put him on his own horse. And I put him on a saddle. I had a little seat belt. And he started being able to use his legs. And the horse could feel it. And he started to go. And if it wasn't going fast enough, he'd reach back with the little saddle strings, give him a tap on the rump. Pretty soon, he was flying across the arena. He was flying across the ranch. He was helping his dad out on the ranch, doing the chores and bringing in the cows. He looked like a little Pegasus with a cowboy hat. <laughs> By the time he was 11 years old, he could walk pretty good. He could ride a bicycle. He could snow ski. And he could even ride a horse bareback and bridleless all by himself. Then it happened. When he was 12 years old, he had a stroke, a massive stroke. He lost everything on the right side of his body. 
Well, today, he rides horses every single day. I just got off the phone with him just before here because he wanted to go to lunch. And he rides six to seven hours every day. He rides and slides. He spins and wins. He turns and burns. He drives everything on the ranch, including his dad crazy. And he's won five championship belt buckles against able-bodied people. And he's even been featured on the cover of a national magazine because of how natural he is in all of his accomplishments. This is proof there is nothing you can't do when the horse becomes a part of you. And you cannot force this. This is something only that can happen through love, language, and leadership in equal doses. And yes, every horse has a puzzle to solve. So we have to use lateral thinking. We have to be able to think outside the barn. But using these principles to get horses to be partners with humans and using these principles to be partners with my son and even better yet, the horses started being partners for him. And this is what has enabled him to do the things that he's able to do today. Well, it wasn't always easy. There were some little obstacles, but this is where the lateral thinking part came in. He, they said he would never be able to do math. So I just thought, I can figure that one out. He loved these little red candies named hot tamales. You know which ones I'm talking about? Well, I'd put two in this hand, and I'd say, if you can tell me how much two plus three is, you get the candies. And if you don't, I get the candies. And guess what? Gulp. A month later, I gained about 10 pounds. He got very, very, very clever, though. And I'm telling you, to this day, he is really good with math. As a matter of fact, yesterday morning, I said, hey, Kate, how many horses do you got? He says, easy, Dad. He counted all the legs. He died, divided by four. He said, we got 27.25. <laughs> so we got one, a horse with five legs? <laughs> you know, we all know that we're all different in our personalities, the way we think, the way we learn. And he's no different. Now, I'm a success coach. I try to help people to really get to understand how horses feel, think, act, and play. And for most people, if I give them a concept, I give you about 10 steps, maybe 12 at the most, and most people can get it. But him, it might take 100. Well, these were a little bit of little rungs on his learning ladder, but they were arrows in my quiver as a success coach. Because the 10 steps that you might need might be completely different than the 10 steps the person next to you need. See, most people who are really good at something, they have a cookie cutter, linear, direct line approach to teaching. And they say things like, oh, you know, you just do this. No, well, there's 17 other things you do before you put the just do in. And most people who are very good at things are not great teachers. Well, this enabled me to be a better success coach. It enabled me to be a better uh, partner for my horses and for my son. And as we all know, people all have different personalities. We've all heard about the different personality paradigms that are out there. Well, guess what? Horses have horsonalities. It would be very anthropomorphic of us to say that horses have personalities. Now, there's extroverts, there's introverts, there's right brain, there's left brain. Let me give you a couple examples here. So Magic, she was a right brain introvert, and people were going too fast with her. And she said to me, basically, just if you go down and go slow, go slow enough at first, I'll consider being your partner. Now, the left brain extrovert horse, he says, I'm raring to go. I can't go because I'm raring. I want to put my horsepower into my horseplay. The right brain extrovert horse says, I got to get out of here. I got to move my feet. Somebody stop me. The left brain introvert horse says, move my feet. Yeah, you and who else? I got was Mr. Ed. <laughs> and why would I want to move him anyway, Wilbur? <laughs> you see, we all have met these people. The right brain, le- left brain person, the extrovert, the introvert. You know, the left brain extrovert that says, let's get her done with a bit of fun. And the right brain introvert that says, I don't know, is that going to be safe for the kids? <laughs> and the right brain extrovert that says, let's get creative and do something right now. And the left brain introvert says, now hold on there, Nelly. I think we better slow things way down here and we do some analytics before we make a decision like that. So I guess what we can all learn from this is that linear thinking, direct line thinking is selfish and is probably the beginning and the end to all relationships. But using love, language, and leadership in equal doses, use embellishing it with lateral thinking, learning to think outside of the box, is a great 
blueprint. Now, it's probably easier said than done, no doubt about it, but it's definitely a roadmap. Now, we've all probably heard the biblical saying, do unto others as, they'd have done unto, as you'd have done unto yourself. But maybe those of us who dare to use lateral thinking enough to think outside the barn, maybe we'd adjust that a little bit so as we start our relationships with every different kind of personality, every different kind of horsenality, and maybe even every kind of dogonality. And have you already thought about what kind of personality you have? Whether you carry a purse or not? That we might say, do unto others as they want done unto them. And as I've learned from my horses, my son and my mentors, it's best to keep it natural by being polite, passively persistent in the proper position. But that perspective takes patience from process to product. May the horse be with you.